He's imitated European styles. With the turn of the 19th century, American writers would begin to forge unique ways of expressing their unique experience. The next heading, the vision. The themes of independence and self-reliance are at the heart of Americans' vision of themselves as a new and unique people. They knew they were creating not only a new nation, but a new kind of nation. That sense of newness marked Americans as a people of youth, innocence, optimism, risk-taking, and boundless originality. Let's identify the three essential um, question vocabulary words there as well. All right, let's jump to page 11. Next question, how does literature shape or reflect society? First question here, what social and political forces affected early American literature? Let's get this word in our notes, Puritanism. From the first, Puritanism influenced just about every aspect of colonial life. The impulse to escape to a new world and build a reformed and uncorrupted society shaped Puritan lawmaking, social relations, and daily life. Belief in predestination, John Calvin's doctrine that God has already decided who will be saved, made Puritans search every thought, action, and word for signs of grace. In hymns, sermons, histories, journals, and autobiographies, they aimed only for self-examination and spiritual insight. Next heading, the Enlightenment. By the 18th century, the power of reason asserted itself in America. In speeches, pamphlets, essays, and newspaper articles, the spirit of the times called for debate, clear thinking, and reorganization of the political situation. The Declaration of Independence, for example, is not an outcry for an archaic demand. It is, or an anarchic demand. It is a reasoned document, a controlled statement of the rational argument for independence. Native Americans and African Americans. Relations with Native Americans and the continued enslavement of African Americans left deep marks in American literature. In histories and, captiv and captivity narratives, we have some record of relationships between colonialists and Native Americans. I'm at the top of page 13. Relationships that ranged from trust to distrust, from friendship to hatred. In narratives left both by slaves and slaveholders, we find heart-rending stories of individuals, families, and communities scarred by slavery. I'm going to go back to page 11 for a moment, the American Experience box, close up on history, read with me. African Americans and women in the Revolution. In 1776, more than half a million African Americans lived in the colonies. At first, the Continental Congress did not permit enslaved or free uh, African Americans to join the American army. However, when the British offered to free any male slave who fought for the king, George Washington changed American policy and allowed free African Americans to enlist. About 5,000 African Americans fought against the British. As this eyewitness account demonstrates, they fought with great courage. Quote, three times in succession, African American soldiers were attacked by well-disciplined and veteran British troops, and three times did they successfully repel the assault and thus preserve our army from capture. Women also helped in the struggle for independence from Great Britain. When men went off to war, the women took on added work. They planted and harvested crops, and they made shoes and blankets and uniforms. Many followed their husbands and brothers to the front, where they washed, cooked, and cared for the wounded. Some even took part in battle, including a brave woman named Mary Hayes, who carried water on the battle lines and became known as Molly Pitcher. We've also got another box here, The American Experience on page 12, Thomas Paine, essayist, hero of the revolution, father of the internet. Let's read. This is a contemporary connection. Thomas Paine believed that knowledge is power and that it belongs to all people, not just the wealthy or privileged. He believed that through knowledge, ordinary people could guarantee their own freedoms. Even at a time when the printed word was slow to publish and distribute, Paine's fiery words brought change fueling both the American and the French revolutions. While this pamphleteer and passionate advocate of communication is often seen as a pioneer of investigative journalism, perhaps his true legacy is the Internet. Writing in Wired News, issue 3.05, May 1995, journalist John Katz observed that regarding the Internet, Payne's, quote, ideas about communications, media ethics, 
and the universal connections between people and the free flow of honest opinion are all relative and again, visible every time one modern shakes hands with another, end quote. Paine once said, quote, such is the irresistible nature of truth that it asks all it wants is the liberty of appearing, end quote. When the internet is used in its best and highest forms, truth becomes available to anyone with a computer. Thomas Paine, advocate of all mankind, might recognize the internet as the true product of his own ideals. Let's jump to page 13. The question, what were the major roles of early American writers? Writers not only reflect the social and political forces of their societies, they also influence these forces. They are not just the mirrors of their cultures and their communities, they can also be the fires that make those communities burn with hope, anger, love, idealism, and creativity. Next heading, writer as oral poet and historian. Native American oral poets held places of vital importance for their tribes. They told each community's story, related its history, and honored its heroes. Those of European Americans who wrote journals and histories fulfilled a similar role recording the social and political events that gave meaning to their community's experience. The narratives of de Cadillas and Cabasa de Vaca, as well as William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation, give us perspective on our own heritage. Next heading, writer as preacher and lawmaker. The writers of hymns and sermons believed that their role, ro that their role was to articulate the will of God. Cotton Mather and Jonathan Edwards explained for their communities the working of divine providence in the wilderness, and they did their utmost to instill the fear of God into every member of their trembling audiences. The writers of America's laws and political documents had a different role, to articulate the will of the people. Thomas Paine's pamphlets, Patrick Henry's speeches, Thomas Jefferson's multi-faced writing survive today, not only as a part of history, but also as literature. The next heading, writer as autobiographer. The autobiographer's role goes beyond answering the basic question, what did I do and why did I do it? The autobiographer also asks, why should you be interested in my life? What did I learn from it? What can you learn from it? The slave narrative, for example, of Uchino helped Americans face their own history and ultimately to do something about it. Benjamin Franklin's autobiography combined a fascinating life story with explorations of essential American values. And then please note on page 13, the essential question vocabularies, those three words there. Let's take a look now on page 14 at recent scholarship and the W.L. Andrews observations. America begins with a promise and a paradox. Let's read and take a few notes. By the way, W.L. Edwards, Edwards, I'm sorry, W.L. Andrews, <coughs> award-winning scholar and teacher, whose work focuses on the historical links between white and black writers and the formation of American literature. In addition to his many scholarly publications, he's co-edited three major literature anthologies, the Norton Anthology of African American Literature, the Oxford Companion to African American Literature, and the Literature of the American South, a Norton Anthology. Andrews is currently the E. Maynard Adams Professor of English at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Let's read on page 14 and then 50. It's not just a coincidence that America's earliest literature is highly autobiographical, nor is it by accident that autobiography emerged as a literary form about the same time that the United States became a new nation. Autobiography and America were made for each other. First heading, the promise, a new person in a new country. The revolution in the United States created a new person as well as a new country. At least, that's what the great spokesmen and propagandists of the revolution, especially Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, and Benjamin Franklin, claimed. Franklin, who wore a coonskin cap to the royal courts of Europe, became famous for inventing everything from street lights to eyeglasses. But we read him today because his greatest invention was himself. Franklin gave the new nation, which he also helped to invent, its first literary classic. The autobiography of Benjamin Franklin is the first great American success story. I'm going to read that again. You want to write that down. The autobiography of ben Benjamin Franklin is the first great American success story, a tale of a poor boy who made good. I'm on page 15. The next heading, the paradox, freedom and slavery. We've got to pay attention to this paradox. By the way, the word paradox means two things that don't fit together, right? In 1789, Franklin 
head of Pennsylvania's largest anti-slavery society, signed a petition to Congress advocating an end to slavery in 1789. In the same year, a pioneering African-American autobiography, The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Oludula Iquano, adapted the success story to anti-slavery purposes. Before the American Revolution got underway, Phyllis Wheatley, an African-born slave in Boston, published a book of poetry written in the learned and ornate style of the day to show that the enslaved were just as intelligent and capable as their so-called masters. Yet when the revolutionary orator Patrick Henry demanded in 1775, give me liberty or give me death, no one asked whether the slaves he held on his Virginia plantation deserved the same freedom he so passionately proclaimed. When I was in the sixth grade in a public school not far from Patrick Henry's plantation, I studied Virginia history, a mandatory subject at the time. I remember learning then that my home state was the mother of presidents. My teacher didn't mention that all of Virginia's great heroes, including Washington and Jefferson, were slaveholders as well. No one, not even the framers of the U.S. Constitution in 1787, had found a way to justify the presence of slavery in a land supposedly dedicated to freedom. Eventually, the only solution to America's, America's political paradox was civil war. Final heading, America's destiny in a persistent question. Ever since the founding of the United States, Americans have trumpeted the new country's special destiny to create a new form of government, democracy, that would reform humankind itself. The transplanted Frenchman, Jean de Corvier, uh, believed that democracy could inspire in all who had emigrated to America an original genius that would bind them together in a shared national identity. America's dedication to human rights, particularly life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, would give the new people of America a grand ideal and mission. The most important writers of the early republic extolled the nation's founding ideals, but often questioned the national commitment to them. Then, as now, we ask of ourselves, has America become what Jefferson and Corvicor imagined? We now turn to our study of a number of the Unit 1 uh, readings. This background hopefully will be of some help to you. Thank you.